Chapter 7, Hemoglobin Metabolism. So we'll be going over the structure, how hemoglobin is made, how hemoglobin is made in utero, how we regulate and control hemoglobin production, what are the normal ranges or reference intervals, what hemoglobin actually does, um, what we call the oxygen dissociation curve, abnormal hemoglobins, and how we measure hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a main component of red cells. It is red in color. That's why red blood cells are red. This is what carries oxygen and carbon dioxide. So hemoglobin is actually made up of four heme molecules and four globin chains, which the globin is actually protein chains. So heme itself is a little pocket that's inside the change, the globin portion of the change, chains, and it's usually on the surface of the hemoglobin molecule. Heme is responsible for allowing us to bind oxygen and carbon dioxide, and this is a reversible. It's constantly going on for the whole lifespan of the red blood cells, which is roughly 120 days. So let's look at the structure of heme. This is actually just heme. So you can see it is a ring of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, and this is a, called the porphyrin 9 ring when we're looking at the whole thing here. And when it has the iron in the ferrous state here, then it is called ferroprotoporphyrin. So this is actually just heme. Okay. The portoporphyrin 9 ring, once iron gets inside, it's called ferroprotoporphyrin. So let's look at the globin part of hemoglobin. The globin part is either usually two alpha chains, you know, because they use Greek letters. So two alpha chains and two beta chains. That's a normal hemoglobin, hemoglobin A, which we'll learn about in a little bit later. So you can see how the heme molecules are attached here on the surface of the hemoglobin molecule. So when we talk about the structure of hemoglobin, it goes through different phases on how normal proteins are made. So it goes from a primary to a secondary to a tertiary to the quaternary structure, which is the one that we're going to be seeing in the next slide. Now, there is one hemoglobin molecule that's a very important for us to know. And in hemoglobin A, in the 1C position, is where we actually hold glucose. So it's called hemoglobin A1C, or glyco glycated or glycosylated hemoglobin. And this is what's used, you know, to measure glucose and like diabetics to monitor how they're controlling their glucose. So when we talk about the globin chains in hemoglobin, Remember, we just showed you there are two pairs of polypeptide chains. Normally, it's alpha and the beta chains. Roughly, they're made up of 100 or so different amino acids. Now, there are other polypeptide chains, and it's usually Greek letters that we're talking about. So it's delta, epsilon, uh, gamma, different ones. And depending on this sequence of amino acid here, here is what will determine what types of globin chains that we're going to be dealing with. So we can actually break the polypeptide chains into different segments and from group A to group H. That's where you see that 1C portion coming into effect right there. So here's a three-dimensional sort of picture, what the globin chains look like. So you can see there's two pairs here at the top. This is what we're looking at is alpha 1 and alpha 2, and the two bottom, which they consider non-alpha. This is, you know, usually in most hemoglobin molecules, there's always two alpha and the two bottom non-alpha, which in this particular case we're going to call beta. Um, so when we talk about other hemoglobin molecules, you'll see that these beta do change to different types. So in each of the hemoglobin molecules, these globin chains we're looking at, you can see the little blue things here. That's the actual heme group. So remember, that's a portoporphyrin 9 ring with the iron in it, so it's a ferroportoporphyrin. And in this little pocket is where we actually will hold oxygen or carbon dioxide. So each heme molecule can hold one oxygen. So when we have four heme globin chains here we're looking at, hemoglobin, that means four hemes, four oxygens. So how do we make hemoglobin? Well, inside of the cell, which this has to be done in a red blood cell that has a nucleus, 
we have the mitochondria and the cytosol, which is the cytoplasm. One of the first steps in the mitochondria, which is considered one of the key rate limiting steps, in other words, one of the most important steps, is glycine and succinyl coenzyme A in the presence of amino levulinic acid synthase, which is ALA synthase, will make ALA. It will now go into the cytoplasm, and ALA dehydrolase will make porphyrolinogen. Then we have the deaminase made hydroxyl bilane with uroporphenogen 3 synthase, making uroporphenogen 3 with uroporphenogen decarboxylase, making corporporphenogen 3. Goes back into the mitochondria to make corporporphenogen oxidase enzyme, but then make protoporphenogen 9 with protoporphenogen oxidase to make portoporphenogen 9. And then the uh, second most important step is a binding of the ferrous, the iron molecule, with the enzyme ferroketolase to make heme. So, you know, this is going into the mitochondria. So, most important steps to know is a glycine and coenzyme A with ALA synthase, and then the ferroketolase put a portoporphenogen 9 to make heme. All right, so once we go back into the cytoplasm, here we have the ribosomes, you know, which make the proteins, so they will make the different polypeptide proteins, the chains, either the alpha, the beta, the zeta, the delta, the gamma, whatever. They will attach to the heme, so you can see how they are now attaching. And the final product here is the alphas and the betas being attached. You can see them up here, and here is the bottom, the end product. So we've got four polypeptides, four hemes capable of holding either oxygen or carbon, carbon dioxide. So in the heme biosynthesis, you know, the mitochondria and the cytoplasm of all the immature erythroid precursors, in other words, this is inside of the bone marrow um, where we produce, produce hemoglobin. You know, once a red cell matures, it will lose its nucleus and the mitochondria. And at that point, it cannot make any more heme, more hemoglobin. You know, it's full, what they call complement, this full amount of hemoglobin is made when it is now a mature red blood cell. So the big step that we talked about in the beginning, glycine and succinyl coenzyme A with delta ALA synthase to form ALA. When we go from that mitochondria into the cytoplasm, where we talked about the de delta ALA synthase, it actually has another cofactor, which we didn't see in that previous picture, but it has an, actually a vitamin there, which is actually a cofactor, vitamin B6. So it's essential. So there's a lot of necessary things for us to produce hemoglobin. Now, remember we said when hemoglobin is made, we have a protein that's in the bloodstream that's going to bring iron to it. Because remember, we have to have iron inserted into the heme molecule or we won't be able to hold oxygen, you know, the whole purpose of a red blood cell. So the actual protein that's floating around in your bloodstream that actually transports iron is called transferrin. Uh, so we'll actually we'll have the iron and we'll transport it to the bone marrow so that the developing red blood cells can then insert it into make, making heat. Now, sometimes, you know, your body is very good at recycling and saving iron. So what we try to do is any excess iron is saved on the molecule of ferritin. So, because remember, iron is huge because it is going to go through the membrane to the mitochondria, and that's where that portoporphyrin 9 ring will allow iron to be inserted in the presence of ferroketolase to make the heme. So remember, once the heme leaves the mitochondria now, you know, it's a whole thing, it will then attach to the globin chains in the cytoplasm. So those globin chains, you know, are constantly being made in the ribosomes. And usually the globin chains being made is equal to the amount of the portoporphyrin 9 ring, the porphyrin synthesis. There are basically six genes that control the globins. You know, so there's alpha, zeta, gamma, beta, delta, and epsilon genes that control it. These chains are usually located in the ribosomes of the cytoplasm. 
so we can actually form the correct globin chains that we need. Now sometimes <clears throat> if we're not making the chains that we need fast enough and excess iron is built up because the chains aren't being made to the equal amount of heme that's being made, so this extra iron that we'll see in the red blood cells of the nucleus, a nucleated red blood cell, will be called a sideroblast. And this is an important thing that when we talk to about certain anemias, you need to know. So a sideroblast is a red blood cell with a nucleus, nucleus, a nucleated red blood cell with iron in it. Now, sometimes we can see red blood cells in the peripheral bloodstream with iron in them. So these are just mature red blood cells with no nucleus, and they have little chunks of iron in them. And they will actually be called Pappenheimer bodies is what they look like. So when we do red cell morphology, we'll talk about it then. So hemoglobin, you know, you see all the different components that are going on to try to make it, you know, got the heme and the globin, so they got to be joined. So the different types of hemoglobin made are hemoglobin A, A2, and F. They are the more normal ones that are made. How we determine what type of hemoglobin is, we can either do electrophoresis or high-performance liquid chromatography, which is HPLC. And we'll explain electrophoresis here in a little minute. So normally when hemoglobin is being made, it's being started, of course, in utero. So you go through the first trimester, second and third trimesters, and we'll see a graph here in a second. Um, so at birth, a baby usually has hemoglobin A and hemoglobin F. As you become an adult, is hemoglobin A is the most common uh, hemoglobin we have, hemoglobin A2, and a little bit of hemoglobin F. So let's look at the chart as to what this is. So you can see here, the, the here is looking at epsilon and zeta. You can see they're very quick, you know, large amounts, and they drop off extremely fast. The alpha chains start increasing, <clears throat> and they stay at a plateau all the way through adulthood. Here the gamma in utero is very high. Once a baby is born, it drops off. The beta sort of increases in the last part of the first trimester. It comes up and it's sort of equal to the alpha. And then when we're looking at the delta change, you can see there's a little bit there. And that's actually going to be part of hemoglobin A2 a little bit. So development of the different types of red blood cell, it depends on the gestational age. It depends, you know, the amount of weeks after the baby's born. Because it actually starts out, you know, where we're switching. Genes are turning on, turning off. You know, zeta goes to alpha, epsilon goes to gamma, delta, and beta. Uh, so the first three months, like we showed you, the zeta and epsilon are there, and then they sort of go off, uh, disappear. So in a normal adult, we have two alpha and two beta. And also in adult, we have a little bit of hemoglobin A2, which is two alpha and two delta. And then we have a small amount of hemoglobin F, which is two alpha and two gamma. So sometimes you'll see hemoglobin written HGB or HB. You know, it, it's the same thing. It's just the way it's written sometimes. Um, and then here we talked about the hemoglobin A1C. Remember, that is where glucose is actually attached. And this is what we use to monitor diabetics to see how much glucose is in the system. So here is the, you know, actual stages that occur, and you can see the actual percentages of what's going on. So at birth, alpha and gamma, which is hemoglobin F, you can see it's 60 to 90 percent. The alpha and beta, which is hemoglobin A, is 10 to 40 percent. And usually between two years through adults, you know, hemoglobin A, A1, A, basically is what we call it, is 95 percent, it's the majority of it. And then A2, so it's like alpha and delta is less than 3.5, and alpha and gamma, F, is 1 to 2 percent. So in a little bit of review, remember hemoglobin, the globin ch chains, once they're released from the ribosomes in the cytoplasm, will bind to heme, and then that's when they pair off the alpha, beta, alpha, beta. Like I said, so the most common is the 2 alpha and the 2 beta, which is hemoglobin A. Hemoglobin A2, again, is 2 alpha, 2 delta. Hemoglobin F is 2 alpha, 2 gamma. 
Now, these three different types of hemoglobin have different globin chains. Remember, they are made up of different amino acids. So what we do is we try to separate the different types of hemoglobin by using electricity. And because of the different amino acids, they respond differently to the electrical charge. So let's look at the picture of it. So this is an actual electrophoresis unit. So you can see there's an electrode, positive and a negative here. We actually have liquid in here. They call that a buffer. And then we have like this gelatin looking stuff here called a gel. It's actually auger. And then we cut little slits in it. That's where we put the samples in. And then you apply electrical current to it. Okay. So what will happen is because of the different amino acids and the different type of hemoglobin, they go at different speeds. In other words, in other words they migrate, they move at different speeds so that we can actually, once we finish electrophoresis and we apply a stain to it, we can actually see which hemoglobin it is. So if you look here on the right, you can see this is a gel that's already been electrophoresed, which is here on the left, and they've applied a stain to it. So anything in this particular line is hemoglobin A. So we've cut little wells in here. We've inserted the patient's uh, red blood cells in this area. And we applied an electrical current to it. And the cells migrated or moved at a different speed, depending on which hemoglobin chain it is. If it's, you know, like hemoglobin A, remember, said it's 2 alpha and 2 beta, it would be here. So from this, we can determine which hemoglobin it is. Is it A or is it F? Is it S? Is it C? I mean, there's other electrophoresis that can determine A2. Um, hemoglobin D, G, I mean, there's a whole variety there. So what we actually do is we can see what it is. Like here, you're seeing hemoglobin A, F, S, and C. And depending on how much is there, like we can see here, it's a lot of hemoglobin S. So that person probably has uh, sickle cell anemia. Here is hemoglobin A and S. So they have sickle cell trait. You know, so we can have different things that we can see here. And we have a machine that will actually measure the density. In other words, how much is in that particular band, that little band there. So we can determine what type of anemia we, we're dealing with. And this is when we're going to be talking about hemoglobinopathies a little bit later in the semester. So, what controls hemoglobin production? Remember, you know, it's a whole pathway that's going on, what we're talking about here. Remember, there was two huge key rate limiting steps. The initial one of glycine and succinyl MA to form delta ALA. And ALA synthase will inhibit heme. In other words, it's negative feedback. In other words, we're seeing too much, then it will actually stop this production. Also, ferroketolase, where we insert iron into the port of porphyrin 9 ring, works by negative feedback. That's how heme is controlled. The globin will be determined by how DNA is transcribed into RNA to produce the globin chains that we need in the ribosomes. So if you've got not enough heme being produced, that will slow the globin synthesis. If more heme is being produced, then that will speed up the globin synthesis. So only complete hemoglobin, heme and globin, will actually be contained in the red blood cells, the finished product, so we can carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. So remember, heme regulation is two key rate limiting steps, and it works by negative feedback mechanism. The globin regulation is by how we, transcri how we uh, transcribe and translate what goes on from the DNA to the RNA to actually make the proteins. And how does the body regulate it? Well, it regulates it through the kidneys. The kidneys will determine the oxygen concentration. If there's hypoxia, then it will release a hormone erythropoietin, which then tells the stem cells to produce more red blood cells. So what are the hemoglobin reference intervals? If you look in your textbook, if you open up the front cover, you will see those hemoglobin reference intervals. And you'll see that there is a difference between men and women, newborns, children. It's because men have more of a muscle mass, so they usually have more hemoglobin. 
women have like a monthly bleeding, you know, menstruation, so their hemoglobin will be lower than men. Newborns usually have a lot of hemoglobin, and it drops off to about two ages of two, and then it'll slowly start coming back up. So children, <clears throat> like I said, the age of two, it'll be like 10 to 11-ish and slowly come back up. Now, what effect does altitude have to do on it? Well, remember, altitude is, you know, we're talking about the percentage of oxygen in the air. So here at sea level, our oxygen concentration is roughly 21% or so. If you go to Denver, then you're starting to decrease. It might be 17 or 18 percent. That does make a difference as to what affects the amount of hemoglobin that's actually being made. Because if there's less oxygen in the air, that means we've got to have more red cells with more hemoglobin so we can get more oxygen to the tissues. So the function of hemoglobin, I mean, its main function is to bring oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and to take carbon dioxide away from the tissues back into the lungs. Now there is other functions that hemoglobin does. It does electron transport, it does oxygen reduction, and it does transfer oxygen for different hydroxylation type of reactions. There is another protein um, that binds oxygen called myoglobin and it's usually seen in skeletal or cardiac muscle, and it will actually bind oxygen too. So in other words, when the red blood cells drop off the oxygen to either the skeletal or cardiac muscles, myoglobin will grab that oxygen and bring it into the tissues, into the you know skeletal or cardiac tissues. Because remember, oxygen is needed for us to make muscle contraction. We need that to make ATP so that we can have muscle contraction. So myoglobin, which at least we said is in skeletal and cardiac, it has a greater affinity. Now, what does affinity mean? It means it has a greater need. It has a very strong pull on grabbing oxygen from the red blood cells into its protein. So it'll make it release. Uh, it's not very good in delivering oxygen to the tissues, but it brings oxygen in quicker. Now that one oxygen here is a link for you to open um, so you can look at the PowerPoint and open that link and it's actually from your publisher Elsevier and when you open that you need to go to the red blood cell structure and click on the oxygenation and it'll be a little video for you to look at. So function of hemoglobin bind oxygen to the lungs transport it into the bloodstream and load oxygen to the tissue. That's the whole purpose of oxygen of, uh, delivery. High oxygen affinity. In other words, hemoglobin, remember, carries oxygen or carries carbon dioxide. So when it's carrying oxygen, it's called oxygenated hemoglobin. When it's not carrying oxygen, it's carrying CO2, then it's called deoxygenated hemoglobin. And actually, the hemoglobin molecule actually changes shape. It changes how it holds oxygen and we'll see in the next slide. So when you look at oxygen or hemoglobin when it's in the oxygenated state, the one here on the right, you can see the heme here holding the oxygen, the four oxygens, the four heme. You can see how it's like turned a little bit. Um, so what is happening is it's more in a relaxed state so they can grab the oxygen. When you get into this tense state, when the oxygen is not there, usually what's in that place of where the oxygen should be is what's called 2,3-BPG or DPG. Either one, same thing. Now, if you remember from the previous chapter, we talked about 2,3-BPG or DPG comes from the rapid port lubering pathway. We actually produce that. And 2,3-BPG controls how red blood cells will hold oxygen. It controls the affinity, we call it, of how red blood cells hold oxygen. So, like we said, 2,3-DPG is a huge molecule, chemical component, that will influence how red blood cells hold oxygen. It, in other words, it's the major player 
on how hemoglobin oxygen affinity in red cells. Because when 2,3-BPG is in the red cell, it doesn't want oxygen. So when 2,3-BPG is not there, red cells want oxygen. So it makes sense. When you're in the lungs, the amount of 2,3-BPG is not there. When you get to the tissue, it's there. It makes us release the oxygen to the tissues now, which is what we want. All right. So 2,3-BPG increases the concentration in a hemoglobin solution. The oxygen affinity, affinity progressively decreases. Because 2,3-BPG does not want oxygen. It takes a place of it. All right. So when oxygen is dropped off by the hemoglobin molecule between the beta chains, it actually widens and 2,3-BPG slips in there. Okay. Now what will happen is there are bridges that form and they're actually called salt bridges that will form between the beta chains, sort of like locking it in. And that's called the tense form. In other words, it's not going to allow oxygen to come in now. It doesn't want it, so it has a lower affinity. And when we have oxygenated hemoglobin, that's where the salt bridges have now been broken. The beta chains have widened apart. They've gotten 2,3-BPG out. And oxygen comes back in because the red blood cell wants it now in the relaxed state. So we try to determine how this occurs in the lungs and in the tissues. And the way we figure this out is called the oxygen dissociation curve. I will have a link up there uh, for you to look at. So it's another guy explaining this also. It's important that you look at this. So you can understand it. All right, so this is the oxygen dissociation curve. You can see we have three different curves here, A, B, and C. And there's myoglobin. A is considered normal. So on the left, on the y-axis, it's a percent of oxygen saturation in the red blood cells. You see 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. On the x-axis is the actual pressure of oxygen that's measured in millimeters of mercury. And you can see that's 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. So basically, when we have 50% oxygen saturation, which will be right here, we have oxygen right here, 50%, which I can't draw a straight line, that's actually given the term P50. So this means we have 50% oxygen in the red blood cells. And if we go straight down, which I can't still draw a straight line, is 27 millimeters of mercury. All right. So what can happen is we can shift to the left. We can shift to the left, which is the B here. And when that happens, it's less amount of oxygen is needed to get 50% saturation. So here, when we're talking about the curve B, which would be a shift to the left, if we want to have 50% and we draw a line here, and then come straight down here, that's pitiful. You can see it's less than 27 now. So that means we have a higher oxygen affinity. When we have to shift the curve to the right and we get 50%, so let's draw a line over this way and then straight down. That's pitiful too. You can see that it's more oxygen, P P50, more oxygen concentration, partial pressure of oxygen. So it's a lower oxygen affinity. All right, so let's look at the curve. Let's try to explain it a little bit better. So remember, we have four heme groups that combine four oxygens. So four hemes, four oxygens. So the amount of oxygen picked up and released by the red cells is dependent on the partial pressure of oxygen, how much pressure of oxygen is actually there. Just think about it. In the lungs, we have a huge pressure of oxygen coming in. Down to the tissues, it's a lot less. Okay? So... The relationship between the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin and the PO2 
is in this oxygen dissociation curve. So let's explain it a little bit more here. You can see here at the top, it's sort of like we can't, we don't have to change much pressure of oxygen to have the same amount as saturation of oxygen. It's sort of equal. It's in this area here, right in the like low 20s to 40, 50 area is where we get the most movement of how much pressure of oxygen will affect the saturation of oxygen in the red blood cell itself. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So here we're looking at the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is defined in terms of the amount of oxygen needed to saturate 50%. That's that P50 we're talking about. So basically what we're saying is when we're looking at P50, what we're saying is that 50% saturation of the red blood cells with oxygen, if you draw a line straight down, ugh, it's need, we need 27 millimeters of oxygen pressure to get 50% saturation of our red blood cells. That's what they're saying. I mean, this P50 is just a term that they use so we can see the movement of the curve either shift left or right which we'll explain in the next slide. Turn this off. Okay. So to shift the curve to the left, so that would be the B curve here, that blue curve here, the darker blue curve. And in this particular way, to shift it to the left, what would happen is the pH has now increased. When the pH actually increases, it shifts the curve to the left, which means less pressure needed to deliver more saturation of oxygen to the tissue, to the cells, to the red cells. They can carry more oxygen. All right. Now, usually what will happen is the DPG, BPG concentration will be decreased because remember it controls oxygen affinity. So now with it shifted to the left, that means with the pH decreased, 2,3 BPG decreased, uh, wait a minute, increased pH, in other words, get more alkaline, and decreased DPG, the body temperature has decreased. So what we're saying is that less pressure of oxygen is necessary to get 50% hemoglobin saturation. So in other words, patients are going to pick up more oxygen easily in their lungs and give it up less oxygen to the tissue. In other words, we're going to be bringing oxygen in more. So sometimes we actually want this to happen. We want to get more oxygen into them and make that curve shift to the left. Uh, one of the biggest things that we see this with is when somebody is in diabetic ketoacidosis, a metabolic acidosis, and they rapidly drive the pH back up, it'll shift that curve to the left to get more oxygen in. And the presence of hemoglobin F, you know, F uh, likes to hold on to oxygen. And we actually see that more in utero. Um, met hemoglobin, methemoglobin, they call it, or carboxyhemoglobin, other hemoglobin variants will cause this curve to shift to the left. Remember, shift to the left means less pressure of oxygen needed to get more saturation in the red blood cells. Okay, so that's a shift to the left. Now, if we look to the shift to the right, so this is the C curve, the lighter blue one here. Now we have decreased pH as opposed to B where we have increased pH. So now it's decreased pH. It's becoming more acidotic. That means more 2,3 BPG is there. The body temperature has increased. So actually we need more pressure of oxygen so we can get 50% saturation. I mean, when you're sick, don't you feel like you have no energy at all? I mean, what is happening is your body temperature is increasing. It's shifting that curve to the right. So now it's going to take more pressure of oxygen to get 50% saturation of your red blood cells. That's what's happening. So where does this happen? You know, somebody has got severe anemia in other words they don't have enough hemoglobin to do this hypoxic areas like such as high altitude 
pulmonary insufficiency, lungs are not working like they should do, congestive heart failure. Again, look at the video that I have attached on there to explain the oxygen dissociation curve. You know, so we can shift it left or shift it right, depending on what we're dealing with. I mean, you can see that there, there's actually myoglobin in here. Myoglobin, remember, is the skeletal cardiac muscle. So you can see not much pressure of oxygen. We get a lot of saturation quickly with that. So let's talk about hemoglobin F. Hemoglobin F has poor bonding with BPG, resulting in a shift to the left in the curve. So what will happen is with hemoglobin F, with a shifted to the left, we need less pressure to get more oxygen saturation of the cells. So a baby, you know, especially in utero, has greater want or need, affinity, to get oxygen from the mother's blood. So that's why a woman is usually, you know, get tired quicker, that kind of stuff, because of the hemoglobin F present. So once the baby is born, the hemoglobin F drops off it's because it's not as needed now. It's less functional because oxygen unload, unloading is, is now more constrained. So after birth, hemoglobin F will drop off. Now there are other hemoglobins out there, carboxyhemoglobin. Carboxyhemoglobin uh, is when we're talking about carbon monoxide, that kind of stuff. Um, it has a strong affinity. Uh, for what we see for red blood cells and it actually will cause oxygen dissociation curve to the to the left I mean this is carbon dioxide excuse me uh, shift to the left um, and that's when we have to force oxygen on people trying to shift that curve to the right as fast as we can so when you look at carboxy hemoglobin this is where CO2 you know from the tissues now goes into the red cells and then it will go out to the lungs to be expired. But sometimes CO2 will combine with water to form carbonic acid you know, because of carbonic anhydrase. This carbonic acid will then attach to hydrogen ions that are in the system and become bicarbonate ions. So this hydrogen bonding to the oxyhemoglobin results in the release of more oxygen. And this is actually called the Bohr effect. So as the oxygen diffuses out of the cells into the tissues, we'll see this occur. So this is in venous. So here you can see the CO2 with water with the carbonic acid releasing that hydrogen ions binding to the oxygen causing more oxygen to be offloaded. So the bicarbonate will diffuse out of the cell and it is replaced with chloride ions here. And that's called the action of the chloride shift. You will learn this more when you get into clinical chemistry. So carboxyhemoglobin, you know, in the lungs, oxygen will bind to deoxygenated hemoglobin because of the high oxygen tension. I mean, in the lungs, that's probably the greatest amount of oxygen, the highest satur you know, highest pressure of oxygen you'll have in your lungs. So as the hydrogen disassociates from the oxyhemoglobin, it will then com com combine to form the bicarbonate again. So that will dissociate into CO2 and H2O, H2O water. So this CO2 will diffuse out of the cells, you know, picked up by the red blood cells, taken to the lung, and then that's where we get rid of it through expiration. Now there are conditions where the hemoglobin is not in the ferrous state, it's in the ferric state. Now, when it's in the ferric state, which is the 3 plus state, it is not capable of binding oxygen. So, what will happen is we have a, you know, the person will become cyanotic looking. And you can see this man, this is a man that has problems with the, they call it methemoglobin. Methemoglobin is another way it's called. So what has happened is there has been some kind of enzyme deficiency uh, that's occurred or it's some kind of strong oxidative drug that has caused the ferrous to be in a ferric state. So that is shifting the dissociation curve to the left, to the left which has less oxygen to the tissues, the patient becomes cyanotic. So this man is actually blue in color because of that. 
Another type of abnormal hemoglobin we have is hemoglobin with sulfur. And that's if the patient is re receiving sulfur-containing drugs that can give them a soft hemoglobin. Um, it's actually reversing how, irreversibly changing how hemoglobin and oxygen will attach to it. Um, so it can't revert back to the oxyhemoglobin. It sort of stays with the soft hemoglobin variety, and it could possibly cause death. Other hemoglobins we have there, carboxyhemoglobin. This is where we have, like we said, the CO2 that we're talking about. And then carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is CO, um, and it seems to have a strong love of how hemoglobin will attach to it. In other words, it will attach to it 200 times more than oxygen will. And it's very hard to get the carbon monoxide to release from the oxygen. I mean, you actually have to alter the pH in the person to get the carbon monoxide to release. Now, the way we measure hemoglobin is by two different ways. Uh, the first one is a sine methemoglobin method. Uh, it's actually a reagent that we use that will actually lights, in other words, tear apart the red blood cell to release a hemoglobin. We have potassium uh, ferrocyanide and potassium cyanide to it. So it will change to a sine methemoglobin. And then it's actually measured in a spectro spectrophotometer um, in the instrument by the absorbance. You actually have a lab that will explain this, and there's a chapter that will explain this again a little bit farther. There's another way that we can measure um, hemoglobins with a little finger prick method, which you will see in the blood drive, and that's using sodium lauryl sulfate. It smells like rotten eggs. Um, there's advantages to it because you're not dealing with cyanide. It works very quick. It's not as accurate as a cyanide methemoglobin method. So, what do we talk about? Um, what molecules join together to form hemoglobin? You know, we talked about the globin chains, the um, ferroproteoporphin ring, the four different structures of hemoglobin, you know, the regulation and the making of heme and globin. You know, what are the different types of hemoglobins we saw in the fetus, like hemoglobin F? Uh, then we later see hemoglobin A and A2. What are the functions of hemoglobin? We went through the oxygen dissociation curve and what can cause a curve to shift to the left and to the right. Now, what are the causes of the different abnormal hemoglobin? Hemoglobin, so soft hemoglobin, uh, the met hemoglobin. And now, how does these abnormal hemoglobins affect how oxygen is delivered? There will be a link for you to look at the oxygen dissociation curve that will explain it again. If you have any questions, please email or send questions, text. Hopefully, you know, go through this again, read your textbook, look at the questions, and hopefully that will answer some of them. Thank you.